All right, we're going to get started now. Uh, like I said, my name is Gila Mayer, and I am the Director of Operations at the uh, Design for Social Innovation Master's Program at the School of Visual Arts. And I'm also here with my colleague, Chi, who's the assistant to the chair at DSI. And later on, we'll introduce you to two of our students um, here in the DSI program. Just want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to discuss today. Um, first, we're going to start with an introduction to what we talk about when we talk about design for social innovation. And then we'll give you a quick overview of the faculty that you'll work with, as well as the skills and courses that you'll learn and take here at DSI. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the clients and really cool events that you'll get to be a part of as a DSI student. And then I'll introduce you to two students, Rhea and Josh, so that they can tell you a bit more about their experience. And Chi will answer um, some commonly asked questions about the application and finances. And then we'll open it up to questions. If you have any questions or any issues during the webinar, um, just type them into the chat function and I will try and address them um, at that time or during the open question and answer portion. So when we talk about design, we think of the traditional designer as an individual creator. So think of Steve Jobs or Frank Lloyd Wright. But when we talk about design for social innovation, we're really talking about co-creation of a more resilient future. We want to make cities more vibrant. We want to help multinational corporations be a force for good. And we want to create a more sustainable future. And that really requires designers facilitating a process and taking their traditional design skills and working with a group of experts um, to create transformation at a systems level. Um, and we find that in this work, designers are evolving from creative, from creators to creative transformers and from authors to partners. It's really about the collective and not about the individual. And so at DSI, um, we've taken this philosophy and um, as a new MFA program, which started in June um, or September 2012, um, we're a model and resource for how design um, can collectively solve human and business problems. And we're training the next group of leaders in the design for social innovation movement. And we do this by um, having our students immerse in all complex systems that affect the future. So we look at all of the systems like food, environment, or health that touch um, many factors around the globe and many individuals. And then we look at how we can create systemic change using design process and methodologies. And um, with this education, you can really work in any sector. We don't believe that designers should be siloed to a specific kind of job or specific kind of organization, but rather designers and designers for social innovation can work in business, government, philanthropy, the social sector, or as entrepreneurs. So as a DSI student, you'll learn from some of the most transformational leaders um, in design for social innovation. They're skilled in everything from uh, corporate social responsibility to data mapping and visualization, transmedia activism, uh, ethics, leadership, entrepreneurship, and, um, and game design, and much more. Um, the chair of the program is Cheryl Heller. She's a world-renowned communication designer that's worked on the identity um, and business strategy of some of the world's um, leading corporations and um, nonprofits. There's also individuals like um, Bill Gordon, who works with local startup entrepreneurs um, in Connecticut, and individuals like Maggie Breslin, who pioneered the role of designer at Mayo Clinic um, and helping to understand and map patient needs with the operations of the clinic. And from these faculty members and through the program, you'll learn what we um, call social design skills. And that's really a combination of the skills that we think are most important um, from both traditional design skills and the skills that anyone would need to be an effective participant in social impact work. Um, so we really emphasize mapping, storytelling, um, systemic thinking, uh, critical writing and critical writing and critical thinking um, and ethnographic research. Um, but you'll also have opportunities, whether you're a designer or come from a non-design background, to work on your traditional design skills and work on other skills that you'd need to be an actor in social change, like facilitation, like negotiation, and like uh, relationship building, which we believe are really important. And you'll learn these skills through the courses that you'll take. Everyone takes the same classes over two years um, with your small um, cohort. And um, 
it starts out in the fall of your first year with kind of an introduction to social innovation. You'll take a fundamentals course, which really helps you work on your soft skills as an actor in social innovation. Um, you'll also take a communication design class, which I'll talk about more in a minute, where you'll work with real world clients on um, business problems. And you'll have an introduction to mapping and visualization design. In the spring, you'll dive a little deeper into specific area topics, such as environmental ethics, informal economies, and game design. And then in your second year, you take two year long classes, one in metrics and data visualization, which really um, emphasizes how to um, measure impact and how to visualize it. And then a course in entrepreneurship and leadership where uh, you will actually start your own business in small teams and learn about leadership and collaboration skills that you can apply um, to your small teamwork. And then throughout your second year, you also work on your thesis, which will um, ultimately be a prototype of a product or service or a research project around um, design for social innovation. And throughout the two years, um, all the students come together to, to participate in a global guest lecture series where um, renowned individuals like the VP of MTV, um, the head of sustainability at fashion brands, uh, and local entrepreneurs come and talk about what it means to work in social innovation. As I mentioned, from your first day of school, you work with real world clients. Um, and that happens uh, through a number of ways, but one of them is the communication design class where you work with clients like L'Oreal, Datakind, Plum Organics, and then a number of local and international startups uh, to help them with communication and business strategy. Um, and this is a really great opportunity to work in small groups um, and collaborate with uh, clients in the real world on uh, design for social innovation and what you're learning in your class. And then as a student here, you also have access to a number of really cool events, both by planning them and by participating in them. Um, our students recently hosted the first TEDx SVA here at DSI, and it was about the future of cities. Uh, they're also currently planning a social enterprise boot camp with students from Columbia and NYU. And um, they also had the opportunity to speak at the Better World by Design Conference in Rhode Island recently and attend an event with leading experts in design, such as Andrew Revkin from the New York Times and winners of the Buckminster Fuller Award um, to hear about design for 100%. And the students that you'll uh, be in class with um, come from 15 different countries. So they're extremely diverse, both in terms of background and in terms of the skills and experiences that they bring to DSI. Um, and it's a really unique opportunity to um, interact with such wonderful individuals um, from all different backgrounds. And the great thing about DSI is that um, as much as you'll learn from your faculty and courses and client work, um, you'll learn so much from your peers as well because it's a very collaborative group work program um, and everyone um, has such diverse perspectives and skills to bring to the table. So with that, I want to introduce you to two students. Um, Josh and Ria are here with us and um, they're going to tell you a bit more about their experiences and why they um, decided to join DSI. So I'll start with Josh, who's on the phone with us. Um, Josh, can, uh, can you test out the mic? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. So uh, what am I doing? Uh, I'm well, just, we yeah, have... I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm just talking a little bit about sort of why I chose to come to DSI and what my experience has been like. Um, so I, uh, as far as my background is concerned, I had been working in design for a while before I decided to come back to school. I had been <clears throat> involved in a, a startup in New York uh, focused on uh, food waste collection and composting, and I had also been on fellowship in India for... Uh, eight months designing some low-cost farm tools for small farmers and so I knew that I had a an interest and a commitment to uh, using design as a as a process and a tool for uh, addressing uh, social issues that I was interested in but I didn't have all of I guess I didn't know if I had all of the skills that I needed to and the confidence that I needed to and the network that I needed to 
uh, to go out there and and continue doing a lot of the work. And DSI was sort of in its first year and one of the uh, first class of students, and it seemed like it would be a really great opportunity to be surrounded by other people who were sort of interested in in doing that type of work, just like me, and uh, sort of. Uh, hungry to learn more and uh, the faculty was top-notch and a lot of people had a lot of experience doing this type of work and so I decided to jump in and here we are um, and I guess as, as we move on if there are specific questions that people have I'm happy to answer them but uh, or Gila if there are specific uh, points that you want me to touch on I'm happy to do that too Great. Thanks, Josh. We'll, um, we'll catch up with you again in the question answer. And if anyone has any questions for Josh, um, they, can, they can direct it towards him. Um, and now we're going to have Rhea um, talk a little bit about her experience. She's a new student, so she's been with DSI for um, just the past few months. Um, hi, guys. I'm Rhea. Can you hear me properly? I hope so. Um, so just in terms of my background, as, as Hila said, I am new here. I've been here for a couple of months. Um, I'm from Bombay, which is in India. And I my background is actually in economics and international development. But while I was in Bombay, I worked with um, a couple of social businesses. And in particular, I was focusing on the marketing and communications and the measuring social impact space. Um, so actually, this program was a great fit for me in terms of bridging my previous background, which is in economics, and thinking about how I want to apply um, my international development background in the design space. So um, I think what really drew me to this program uh, is that is that it's more an applied design program, which really teaches you how to think about design and how you can use design for something that's more than what Hila was mentioning before, which is a very siloed design experience in terms of just graphics or just product design. Um, this is much more about how you can use design principles and design thinking and importantly systems thinking, which is something that uh, we really focus on in class over here, um, and how you can use it in the development space. Um, and so I think that a lot of what Hila touched upon has been a part of my experience here. I've had the opportunity to participate in a number of events, uh, which is really cool. And I've met some really incredible people. As Josh also mentioned, our faculty is amazing. Um, we have a really cool mix. Um, so no matter what your background or your interest is, you will definitely find um, somebody that you could, or not just one person, but probably tons of people that you could talk to. Um, so it's a great program and I'm really happy here. And I think that um, particularly if you're kind of, uh, if you're a designer and you're looking to apply design in a more meaningful way, then this is uh, a great fit for, for you. Great, thanks Ria. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Chi, who will talk a little bit more about the application process and then we'll open it up to questions. Hello everyone. So a question that we usually get is who are we looking for as our students? And we're looking for people from diverse background. We want you to have a passion for something, be it ethics, creativity, or anything in life, any problems that you would like to fix. So we are not looking for just graphic designer or visual designers. We are looking for designers who can um, change any kind of systems, so educational system or the food system. Um, our students, as you have already heard from um, Ria and Josh and Hila, came from absolutely diverse backgrounds. We have students in business and fine arts and trend prediction, engineering, architecture, you can name it. And we have students in those backgrounds. Um, we understand that this is an MFA program, so we do offer courses uh, like motion graphics and graphic design classes for students to catch up if they would like to um, improve those skills. Um, SVA students have access to lynda.com where you can learn any programs you can imagine for free. Um, as for the application process, what we are looking for is the online application where you can find through our website or through the SVA website. Um, 
within that application, there is a resume that you have to include that talks about your professional experience, educational experience, and any skills that you find relevant. Um, to this program or you would like to include. Um, the essay tells us about who you are, what you want to accomplish through the program, what dreams and hopes you would like to have or already have for the future. Um, the reason why we offer portfolio and case history as an option is because we understand that not every student will have a design portfolio. So that's why we would... we offer the case history where you can talk about the different projects you have worked on um, and give us an overview of how you have um, worked on social innovation or other projects in the past. Um, the official transcript, for example, for international students, if it's in a different language, we ask you to translate it word by word into English. Um, once you are under consideration of through all of the application elements, you are offered a personal interview with our chair, either through Skype or in person. And applications are due on January 15. Um, we hope to see your application. Um, as for the financial aid aspect of uh, the tuition, it costs 19300 to each semester, and we have four semesters over two years. SVA and DSI both offer merit scholarships, and um, for SVA, we will match 25% of any outside scholarships up to $2,500, so we encourage our students to apply for as many outside scholarships as possible. Um, more information on the financial aid aspect you can find on our resources page on our website. Um, there are a lot of questions that we are often asked, so I would like to address them. Um, we often accept around 25 students per class. There are work study and internship position available for students um, once they enter the program through both SVA and DSI. The classes are held from six to nine, uh, the majority of the classes, for a first year student, you have one class during the afternoon, and for second year students, you have uh, all classes at night in order to ascertain that you can do your internships or jobs or anything else that you would like out to do outside of the program. SVA provides both housing and health insurance. Housing prices uh, varies according to the size of the room or, and where you uh, want to live, and health insurance is around $900 per per year, and you can opt out of the program if you choose to. Uh, for international students, the um, forms that you ha would have to submit along with the application once you're accepted to the program is the Declaration and Certification of Finances. So it's just a bank statement stating that you have enough funding for the next year and an I-20 um, so you we can process your visa to come to the States. So um, with that, we will open it up to questions, and um, you can raise your hand using the raise the hand function, and we can unmute you, or you can type your question into the box, the chat box. And we actually have um, two questions from Dean already, which I will answer. Um, and the first was about the kind of jobs that you'll get, which is a question that we get a lot. So um, since we're a new master's program, and it's a two years program, um, we haven't graduated any students yet. Um, and they will graduate in uh, June 2014. Um, so we are working really hard right now to create relationships with potential employers and, um, and you know, kind of path out the career for each of our students as they graduate. Um, but right now, a number of them already have really fantastic internships in design for social innovation. We have two second year students working with the UN one on partnerships and one with you on women. Um, we have Josh who's working with Arup, which is a, a consulting firm, and he can tell you more about that experience working um, for a corporation. And then we have a student working for the Rockefeller Foundation. We have another student that was just hired as the art director for a nonprofit that supports entrepreneurs in Latin America. And then we have a number of other students doing some really cool consulting work um, or side projects. We have a first year student interning with the State Department. Um, and uh, there's just a number of other 
um, great opportunities for you to take advantage both of the companies in New York City and um, to take advantage of the network that DSI offers. Um, and just as, as an example, we're offering a career fair soon, um, which will bring in individuals from different sectors, including companies like PepsiCo, to come and talk about design careers. Um, and the second question Dina had, and then we'll um, move on to other ones, is if you get accepted, can you be deferred? Um, so that is really on a case-by-case -case basis um, and usually under extraordinary circumstances. Um, and the m most common situation is that um, you wouldn't be automatically accepted into the next year class. You would have to reapply part of your application, such as submitting an updated resume. The admissions office would be able to help you with that. Um, but our department would have to grant you um, the deferral still. And so uh, we usually suggest that you apply, um, you know, ready to enroll full time in fall um, 2014 or fall 2015. Um, we have a question from Cassia. Uh, you participated in the impact program. Uh, is this program an extension of that and how does it differ from that program? So the impact program is really great. I met some of the impact students this summer. Um, it is run by World Studio um, and it is hosted at SVA, but it is not part of our program. Our program is a full two years, um, two year master's program. Um, so you do graduate as an MFA student and um, the the curriculum which I reviewed in the course is um, a bit more intense and of course um, extended over two years as opposed to um, the summer period of the impact program. Um, you know, I think the goals are very similar in terms of encouraging individuals with um, to use design skills and the design process and methodologies to um, create social impact. But I think um, the work uh, at DSI. Um, you know, starts at much more of a systems level and looking at um, using design um, to create systemic change. Um, and I hope that helps. From Julia, which nonprofit supports entrepreneurs in Latin America? Um, there, there are a number of ones, Julia, and I can um, try and follow up with you afterwards and, and, um, and let you know which organization it is. Hi, Ricardo. Um, so Ricardo would like to know if the scholarship provided by DSI is the same as the one provided by SVA. Um, so I'll have Chi answer that one for you. So the scholarships provided by us is not the same as the one provided by SVA. So you can apply for both scholarships. Uh, once your application is in and you're accepted the, to the program, you are automatically considered for DSI scholarships. So that's why we urge our students to apply as soon as possible. So we can give you an acceptance letter, um, as soon as possible, and you will be considered for scholarship on a uh, first come first serve basis uh, with DSI. However, for SVA, uh, it's an additional step to apply for their scholarships, and they will match your outside scholarships. And if um, that's the case, I can help you through that process. And we have a question from Alexandra. So, Alexandra, I'll take you off of mute. Alexandra? Um, if you still have a question, you can feel free to talk. All right. If you have another question, feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, we also have a question from uh, Maria. So I'll take you off of mute, Maria. Maria, are you there? Sorry, I didn't have, I didn't have a question. Oh, okay. I saw your hand. Sorry. No, no problem. Sorry. Um, all right, and Deanna had another great question, which is, are you required to take an internship during the program, or is it possible to maintain your full-time job during the two years? Um, and are many of the current students in the program also doing full-time jobs? Um, so the answer is yes, you can maintain your full-time job during the two years of the program. Um, the the courses are in the evening, and in your first year, you do have several courses and client meetings and other opportunities. Um, during the workday. Um, so it would be very difficult to work a full 40, 50 hours um, and be a full-time student, um, but you you can do it. Um, there's nothing preventing you from doing that. But you know, we do want you to sign up for the program 
you know, committed to the coursework, committed to showing up to class. Um, it's very small classes of only 25 students, and um, it required a lot of participation and outside group work. Um, but no one is required to work, and no one is required to not work um, during the program. Um, and there are many current students doing um, nearly full-time jobs. And I'm just going to unmute Josh for a second if he is still on the line, um, just in case he can talk about his experience so far working. Josh, are you still there? Yeah, thanks, Eva. Yeah, um, I will speak to that. Uh, I came in uh, last year thinking that I was going to be able to work like fairly close to full time, uh, and that was mostly actually on on freelance. And I ended up working about twenty five to thirty hours per week. And there were a couple students in the cohort who uh, tried to work fairly close to full-time jobs last year during the school year and none of them made it through. Uh, that's not to say that it's impossible to work during the school year. I'm working now at AirUp still uh, and <clears throat> um, probably working somewhere between 20 to 28 hours in a given week, sometimes over 30 hours in a given week, but it's, it is uh, it's a bit grueling because the, the coursework is in the evenings, but you also have team projects that you need to meet with teams outside of class time to do, and you need to be able to find time to do schoolwork, um, like to actually have time to do the schoolwork outside of the classes. And so I would, I would just advise, um, it's great to be connected to outside organizations and outside work and continue to sort of like build your networks and your portfolio and career and obviously to make money, but um, I think most of the people, if you asked in the program, like, hey, can you do 40 hours a week, you will be very hard pressed to find, at least in our cohort, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who says that it's possible to manage a life working 40 hours and uh, committing full time to the program. So I just want to, and that's, a, that's just one person's opinion, but that's, you know, I saw uh, a few people burn through trying to do that last year and ended up getting uh, pretty much worn out by that process. And so I would just caution you to be uh, to be aware of that fact that like school definitely does take time and there definitely is a lot of stuff outside of the classes that you're going to need to uh, commit time to. And so um, working is possible and good and definitely uh, something that is encouraged, but full-time work is very, very, very challenging. Thanks, Josh. And do you mind just talking a little bit more about what you're doing right now at Arup? Yeah. So um, Arup is one of those companies that uh, is involved in a lot of things, and tons of things that probably everybody on this phone have heard about, but probably most of the people on the phone haven't heard of Arup. Um, so it's a, it's a global uh, engineering and design consultancy uh, that focuses on the built environment. So instead of like a product designer who would design an object or uh, a graphic designer who would design a piece of communications or something like that, uh, built it, work, working at the scale of the built environment is like Arab's projects are anything from buildings, like if, a, if an architecture firm collaborating with them on designing a new building to designing city infrastructure, like where to put uh, sewers, how to build subway tunnels, so they do they work on bridges, they work on uh, urban master planning when new cities are trying to uh, sort of like evolve or help uh, push forward new agendas, they work on transportation planning, like where do we put new roads, how do we uh, share the roads between various transportation modalities. So. Uh, Arab sort of scope of work is at the at the scale of the built environment, and uh, is highly multidisciplinary. Um, and they're primarily engineers, some designers and architects, urban planners. Um, and my role there is actually in the foresight and innovation team, which is somewhat aligned with the stuff that we do at DSI. So there are a lot of technical experts with a with a broad ar array of professional expertise. Uh, and highly interdisciplinary, but um, getting them all to work together to speak common languages 
to like actually uh, collaborate and work in effective ways is often challenging. So part of the work that we do is about helping uh, get the right people into the room and uh, build processes that can help them like create innovative solutions to problems. And then some of the other stuff we do is about bringing some of the outside world into Arab so that people internally can learn about new trends or can find out about new projects or new pathways for work or new areas of opportunity, whether it's uh, trying to help people in the New York office connect to uh, opportunities to do work in the developing world, let's say, for uh, water projects. I know there's a, there's a team of people internally in New York that are working with WaterAid. Uh, so there's a, the team that I'm in does a lot of this, a lot of this work. It's not purely focused just on social innovation because it's a global consultancy that works with architects and works on all these infrastructure, but pretty much because they're working at that scale, <clears throat> the actual work touches on the lives of, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people on a daily basis, which is a really interesting place to be. So. I'm happy to talk more if people have specific questions. Um, I'm happy cool. to answer them. Thanks, Josh. Um, we actually have one more question for you. And um, Deanna typed in, it sounds like you had a good basis before you got into this program. Do you think you would have been able to get your current position without the program? Or what difference did it make as a factor in your application there? That's an interesting question. Um, so. The getting this role, the how do I put this? Um, I think that the stuff that we do at at DSI definitely sort of sits with you, and it helps inform the way that you approach working in a social system, and it forms the way that you think about how to get things done when you're working in a team or you're working in an organization. And so, to that in that regard. Um, Having been at DSI has certainly helped me uh, navigate the workplace, understand how to have impact and how to like help move people, help listen better and understand what it is that we're trying to achieve as a team, those types of things. Getting my foot in the door, um, I actually knew somebody who worked there and they were the person who helped me connect to who is now my boss there. Um, and I went in for a meeting and we got along really well and she knew about the program. She and Cheryl uh, had worked on a couple of things together and she's uh, very interested in social innovation and is sort of trying to work on, on building an innovative culture at, at Arup internally in New, the New York office. So I think that, that probably in that regard because she knew of Cheryl and she knew of the program and she's sort of interested in some of these ideas about convening the right stakeholders and focusing on like how you bring the right people to the table uh, was appealing to her. But um, the work that I'm doing and sort of the way that I got in there was a little bit uh, outside of the uh, DSI sort of network. Great. Thanks so much, Josh. I really appreciate it. I'm going to put you back yeah. on mute now. Um, we have some other great questions. Um, you guys just keep them coming in. These are great. So David asks if there's future possibilities to have um, MFA DSI on an online platform. And that's a question that we get a lot. Um, and at this time, because we're a new program, we're focused on our full-time um, in-person um, program and opportunities and learning. Um, but, you know, the the sky is always the limit for the future, so we would never rule it out. But right now, um, we are only accepting students um, to be full-time students here. But we'd encourage you to check out our website, um, watch videos from events, um, from webinars. We film a, a lot of our guest lectures and so that you can watch those. Um, but we'd also encourage you to really consider applying to the program and joining us in New York full-time. Um, Christina asks how you can be a strong candidate for the DSI program. Um, and I think it's it's what Chi talked about earlier. We're really looking for passion for social innovation and for passion for using design to impact social innovation. Um, everyone's really unique and comes from really unique backgrounds. And so um, as long as you describe your uniqueness in your personal essay and in your personal interview, um, 
and show us that you're prepared to um, use the skills that you'll gain here and like why you want to gain those skills. I think that makes you a strong candidate for the program. You know, we don't accept designers over non-designers more or people from particular backgrounds over non-particular backgrounds more. We're really looking for a diverse group to come together and um, because that's what, um, you know, really creates collaborative social impact. Um, so, Kasia, you've been working as a graphic designer, and you're hoping that this program can help you bridge the gap between working as the creative at the end of the chain and participating as a strategist at the top. Um, and I think that's exactly what we help you do here at DSI. And so, yes, this program would be a good fit for you. Um, and Tanya, one of our students, is a great example of that. She's a really talented graphic designer from India and um, joined the DSI program um, to really gain skills in, in the other areas that we focus on um, and went back to India this summer and worked as the in-house graphic designer for Teach for India, which is a really big nonprofit there similar to Teach for America. Um, and so, yes, DSI would be really helpful in um, helping you gain those skills um, and also in helping helping you um, find good positions for internships and after the program. And I hope that's a helpful answer. Um, Alyssa, for people with a non-design background, how many supplemental design classes can you take? And um, do those without the background feel or appear to be behind in the program? And I'll have my colleague Chi answer that question for you. And then maybe Rhea can chime in about her experience as well. Um, so we do offer classes, and right now we are offering the motion graphics class um, on Fridays, and people can come and learn from um, the instructor. We also have access to lore, as I already talked about. However, at, once you're an MFA student, you can audit the classes at um, the undergrad levels. So if you feel like you want to improve your graphic design skills, you can take those basic graphic design courses or higher courses at um, SVA free of charge. So for four semesters, you can take four classes in whatever area that you would like to learn about. Um, and then Rhea, do you want to chime in about coming from a non-design background? Yeah, sure. I actually, um, as she mentioned, you can take a bunch of classes as well if you feel that you would like to improve your graphic design skills. Um, and Linda is a great option for that. Uh, having said that, you're not at a disadvantage if you don't have a design background um, because a lot of the mapping and the systems work that we do is not so much focused on how um, it looks in terms of like its graphic representation, but how much you understand the concepts. And so if you don't have a design background, you are not at a disadvantage and you are also, there are many options for you if you would like to develop those skills um, to do that. Great, thank you. And then um, someone has a question. If you find a part-time job at SVA, does the school help cover tuition? Um, Chi can talk about the work-study programs that are available, um, which may be what you're refer referring to. So if you are accepted to the work-study program um, as a domestic student, you are going to get paid um, on a monthly, twice, twice a month um the same thing if you're an international student and you can use that money towards help uh, funding your tuition or your housing or any other um costs that would come with being in the program um great and then maria has a question if you don't have that much professional experience in designer business would you even be considered a candidate for the program? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Like I said, we're looking um, everyone at everyone on a case-by-case -case basis. We're not looking for specific profiles, but rather, um, you know, your passion and your interest and, and your statement for why you want to be in this program and, and what you'll learn from it. Um, just to give you an example, Rhea came from international development and microfinance. Um, other students come from graphic design, others came from branding and communications. Um, we've, we've had students come straight out of college. They studied environmental studies or economics. We've had students study international relations. Um, we've had people that worked with nonprofits, people that, um, you know, come from really all different backgrounds. And so um, I'd encourage you to actually go to our website, um, 
and look at the students page. I'm not sure if our website is, um, our website may be down right now, but we're fixing it. Mm -hmm. So um, that should be back up soon. But when it's back up, I'd encourage you to go to the students page and every student has a bio. And so you can really see how diverse they actually are in not only the field of design that they studied and, and come from, um, if they come from a design background, but also um, just the range of experiences that they've had so far and the countries that they're from. And then Eric has a question. You have a background working in social issues and in social justice. Would that be a good fit and how? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Like I just said, we're looking for people from all different backgrounds and, and we do want you to have a passion for um, social innovation. That's that's why you're in the program and learning these skills and taking these courses. Everything you learn ties back to, to social innovation and social impact um, in your courses and through your client work. Um, so so we'd really encourage you to, um, to apply to the program. Um, and I'll just add one thing. Um, I didn't tell you much about the projects that you actually work on with clients, and that might be interesting for some of you. So right now, um, all of the clients that students are working with are centered around the food system um, because food touches everything and we work at a systems level. Um, and so two of the projects that are really cool um, or three of the projects rather, one group of students is working with a mobile app um, that is looking at behavior change and weight loss and tracking your diet. Um, and then another group of students is working with a mozzarella retailer in Boston um, to help her incorporate education into her retail space. So how do you educate consumers about the dairy industry and about food politics in a retail space? Um, and then another group is working with uh, a, a major corporation on their CSR strategy. Um, and so it really just ranges um, the kind of work that you do. But again, it all ties back to, to social impact and um, business strategy. Are there possibilities to work as a lecturer while pursuing the MFA? Um, I think that's a that's a unique question. So we'd be happy to talk with you after about um, about that um, that question. There are opportunities to TA in the program. Um, are there comparable programs like DSI across the country? That's actually a great question, Margarita. Um, there are a number of programs looking at design for social innovation. Um, it is an emerging field, um, but all of them are really different. Some of them are very design heavy. Others um, don't necessarily have the same emphasis in their curriculum that we have. Um, so so um, there are other programs, but ours is one of the first to really look at design for social innovation as opposed to design with a social impact component or social impact with a design component. Um, and, you know, our leaders, our faculty members aren't, you know, tenured professors at colleges. They're working in the real world. They have their own consulting firms. They have their own businesses that they're running. And then they come and teach in the program. Um, they're still available to be really hands on with you as a faculty member and work with you on a on a regular basis. Um, but they're coming from the design for social innovation world themselves um, and have real world experience that they can um, make relevant to you in the classroom. Um, so I think that makes our program really unique. And then our access to New York City also makes us really unique. Um, and then the emphasis in our curriculum, I mean, I think our emphasis on data mapping and visualization, our um, emphasis on really helping you with the fundamentals of what it takes to be an actor in social innovation, and then our combination of um, theory of design skills, looking at a system level, and then real world application and applied design, um, working with clients and in small teams um, really makes us unique as well. Um, the projects undertaken with you and women, I'm not sure about that. That's with one of our students, um, but I'd be happy to look into that after for you. And then how much travel has been incorporated into the program? Um, that's another great question. Uh, students can take individual um, trips for work during their internships or during their um, work experience. And then as a new program, we're always looking for more opportunities to incorporate experiences abroad. Um, right now, we don't have anything formally with the program, although I know that some students traveled um, in the US for some client projects um, to different cities to work on initiatives there. Um, so I hope that's helpful. And then how heavy is the schedule of the second year compared to the first year? Um, it's the same number of courses. Um, 
And so it's about the same number of hours, but you are working on a thesis project, which is extremely time consuming. Um, and I don't know if Josh can speak more to that. Let me unmute him for a minute. Josh, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I think actually it is one less course. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So uh, in the first year, at least for us, we had uh, Monday through Thursday from 6 to 9 p.m. And then also a class on Wednesday during the daytime from 2 to 5. Uh, so we had five courses for all of the first year. And now we're just Monday through Thursday from 6 to 9 p.m. So we have no more daytime classes. That's uh, so there's one less class. And then also one of those four classes is thesis research class. Uh, so there are assignments for that. But it is assignments that are sort of in, uh, intended to help move your thesis along. Um, so it feels like about the same amount of work because as the number of classes dips down, your uh, sort of focus on trying to figure out what you're going to do for your thesis starts picking up, and then you uh, you know you're spending time doing research and doing interviews with people and taking meetings and and those types of things. So. Uh, I would say the the course load. I guess the course load is slightly less. The workload is uh, about the same. I would say, and part of that also is like, in my experience, uh, the time you give to thesis will ex expand or contract to fit the time that you have. You know, so you, in, unless you're also making time to do even more on it, but it's like it's something that you can always be putting more time into. So you really sort of have to manage the process for yourself, um, and so it can be as much of your day as you want it to be, or you can, you know, do very little and make very little progress. So great, thanks, Josh. Yeah. Um, Karina has a question about. Um, if this presentation will be available for download. And um, yes, we are recording it. So assuming that the recording function works properly, um, we should be able to post it on our website or email it out to you afterwards. And then Margarita has a question, um, another great question. Do you suspect that the DSI program can result in designers being mobilized to have political impact in America and internationally? And I think, I mean, I, the answer is, is yes, of course. I mean, the skills that you're learning are really um you know, related to system thinking and and related to to social innovation that includes government, that includes politics, and so um, you can use those skills for um, political impact work. We have one student that's looking at immigrants in Colombia and a, working um, on a transmedia campaign that um, has some social justice and political components to it. Um, students last year consulted for New American Tavern, which is a business in New York looking um, to convene um, for political uh, discussions. And then we have um, students also looking at, um, one student looking at education, um, which really ties into education policy um, with the work that she's doing. And so there's a role for that as well. And then there's a student working with State Department on their e-diplomacy initiatives. Um, so it really depends on what your particular interests are. And, and if, if your passion is around politics, um, I think you'll gain a lot of skills, both personally and skills and, and knowledge academically that could really help you um, have a political impact. And then um, and then we're going to wrap up in a few minutes if, we, if you have any more questions. Um, how does a student decide on what they want to do for their thesis? Um, Josh has to leave, so I think this will be his last question, but if he could answer that really quickly. Um, it starts in your first year, and then I'll unmute Josh. Uh, yeah, so there's there's a class in the second semester of your first year, which is, I, I believe, called Introduction to Thesis, which is basically like a, uh, a class using some of, some design processes and research processes and, and giving some structure to students to try to get them to come down to sort of what they want to focus on. And obviously, it's not hard and fast, but you can you can 
switch over the summer when you're doing research and, and those types of things, but as a way to get the conversation going and get people having talks with other students and with faculty and with outsiders to, to come to that. It's, it's self-directed to a certain degree because you're going to be committed to this uh, for a good chunk of your life, and so it's important that the thing that you decide to work on is something that you're personally interested in. Um, so uh, I think the school is is pretty open to that. You know, it's like after the first semester, you'll have at least a, a good idea of what sort of falls within or not within uh, social impact, uh, the social impact space, and you sort of just need to be sure that the the thesis area that you're uh, exploring falls in that fairly broad. Uh, piece of the pie, but um, beyond that, like actually choosing your thesis topic, uh, everybody is, uh, is, is doing different things based on their personal interest. So I'm, I'm interested in sustainability and working in sustainability in, in my future, uh, environmental and uh, obviously like triple bottom line sustainability, environmental, social, and, and uh, economic. And, um, and I'm interested in cities and doing that, and so uh, I'm focusing on food systems and, and waste and reducing the amount of waste in food systems. Um, but that's just one person. There's like the like Kilo was saying. There's uh, somebody who's w interested in uh, uh, women's issues the, and, and doing the, about violence. Her thesis research about violence against women. There's people doing stuff on refugees and immigrant populations. There's people doing things on uh, game design. There's people doing things on starting social movements around political activism. Um, there's a, a pretty broad, I guess, uh, w way of looking at it. So um, I think the important thing is is if you have topics and areas that you're really interested in, uh, be willing to explore them and see if that's what you want to do for your thesis. But in the first year, also be sort of open to hearing about and getting excited about other stuff and see if that uh, piques your curiosity enough to want to pursue it and then explore it during that uh, intro to thesis class. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, Kasia has a question. Since the program is relatively new, what kind of clout does the MFA hold with potential employers? And the answer is actually a lot. Um, we have potential employers contacting us on a regular basis, multiple times a week, um, looking for students to intern or to work with their company. Um, SVA as an institution also has a lot of respect. Um, in New York City and beyond. Um, they recently had Facebook come in and talk about design careers at Facebook. IBM is coming in. Um, you know, major, major employers um, that are looking for um, students. And um, you also have the chair of the program who has a long um, established career with um, really influential uh, companies and organizations and design for social innovation. Um, and then the faculty members who work with everyone from Johnson & Johnson to their own consulting firms to the NBA um, and Scholastic that um, have their networks to help you um, with potential employers. And so um, there really is just a lot of a clout and respect already for our program in particular, and then a lot of opportunities for you to access our network. Um, through the work that you're doing here and, and through the unique skills that you're gaining that you might not get from other programs. Um, and the MFA degree itself is, of course, a, a respected degree in the field, um, similar to an MPA or any other degree. Um, how important are the optional letters of recommendation? They are optional, but we do consider them if you submit them. Um, and and, and it's, it's, so it's up to you. Um, so is Milton Glaser part of the DSI ecosystem, especially his work heightening city morale via I Love New York back in the day? Um, I'll have Chi answer that question. Um, Milton Glaser is actually a part of uh, SVA at large. So um, our students have reached out to him and have talked to him in the past in order to uh, get his involvement with TEDx. However, um, Milton Glaser is a part of SVA and not particularly DSI. 
Right. But as a student, you do have opportunities to audit courses. Um, not, I'm not sure if he's teaching any courses anymore, but um, certainly with other faculty members at SVA, that might be an opportunity for you, as well as guest lectures. And then, then Katie has a question about the average debt burden of students when they graduate versus the side of the aid, size of the aid packages. And unfortunately, we don't have any statistics for you on that. Um, but we do work with you on your financial aid to make sure that we can help help you in any way you can to um, to you know join the program. Um, you guys have been so great. These have been really amazing questions. Um, I don't want to take any more of your time, but um, on this last side, I've included all of our contact information for myself, Chi, Josh, and Ria. So if you have more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we really hope that we will see your application um, and hear from you and keep in touch. Um, and thank you for the great questions and thank you for joining us. And if uh, you missed part of this presentation or if any of your friends missed it, um, we've tried to record it. And so if that recording worked, we will share that with you after as well. Um, thank you so much again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.